good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? It's not quite sure, but louder. Is this better? Okay, I'll try. I I'm not very good at talking loudly, but I'll try. So I hope everyone has en had enjoyable lunch and delicious lunch. So it's always a challenge to give a talk after the lunch because everyone starts kind of falling asleep. So I'll try to make it entertaining. And, um, and so this talk is, is kind of a result of um, me somewhere around having last autumn trying to kind of uh, research into the topic, okay, so we have a Linux kernel stack. It has been kind of our uh, targets of various attack for a really long while. And, and, and I was trying to understand, okay, so what's the current status? Because there were some countermeasures uh, merged, notable countermeasures merged in the past uh, to combat some of these attacks. And I was trying to understand, okay, so what's the current status? So are we good now? What's missing? Uh, do we need to do still something? Or we can just say that, okay, this, this area is done. And so, uh, so this is basically what this talk is about. So I will try to give you also, so in order to answer the questions, of course, I had to go ahead and study all the existing attacks and the countermeasures and trying to not just study details of each of attacks because, I mean, you, you can, I can give a talk like explaining you one of these attacks for an hour easily. And, and this is not my goal here. My goal here is trying to, and, and this was not my goal also there when I tried to study it. So I tried to kind of understand what are the patterns, what are the common things, what, why attackers are succeeding constantly in this area. So, and, and, and uh, then I did some gap analysis after, and, and there was also proposed protection, which we tried to merge to mainline, starting from maybe new year uh, time frame. Um, I'm not very optimistic now that it'll get merged after all, so, but I'll get there, so. So before, uh, so I guess here I don't have to explain anyone why it's important. So why attackers really go after Linux kernel? Why it's such an attractive target? If you are for some reason not aware about it, uh, I encourage you to go listen to Case uh, talking on Wednesday and uh, kernel self-protection project. So he'll explain you in great details why kernel is such a nice target. But um, what I kind of started asking myself, why the Linux kernel thread stack? So, so why the kernel stack? And to answer this question is that, um, so I would like to kind of keep you kind of small. Um, I mean, there are two main things, that usually if you're an exploit writer and you're trying to write in while like working exploit against the kernel, not just Linux kernel, any operating system kernel. I'm concentrating mostly on Linux here because I don't know actually anything else apart from Linux, but if you're trying to write an exploit against a kernel, there are two main things you should remember when you're comparing your kind of exploit writing to the user space. The first one being is that in user space exploitation, I mean, if you crash to your process which you're about to exploit, it's usually not so bad. So, I mean, you can recover. The process will get usually restarted unless you have very kind of um, highly sensitive intrusion detection system. It won't get probably noticed because, I mean, user space processes tend to crash and they will get restarted and so on. So if you now in a kernel exploit area and, and you actually crash because if you, something goes wrong and if you kind of screwed up with some offsets and things, you're going to crash a kernel and that's much worse. So you, uh, because I mean, it's much worse for many reasons. First of all, there's no automatic restart possibility. So, I mean, somebody will need to power this machine again and, um, and get it back to you. Second, if you are targeting any production system with high outs, it will raise some alarms because kernel crashes is not so kind of standard event. We are not expecting our kernels to crash randomly. And then also when, even if you kind of, everything is okay and kernel is restarted and machine is restarted, you most likely have to start from zero because some things have changed. If it's randomization in place, your layouts have changed and you'll have to start figuring it out all over. Uh, so this, this thing is that uh, it's like if you read the books on kernel exploitation, they will keep it like every single second page is like do not crash the target, do not crash the target. So this is very important for attackers. And the second thing why it's different when you write an exploit against a kernel is that you really have much less understanding of a memory layout around you which you're trying to play with. So in user space, you're attacking a particular process, uh, you usually have quite some understanding of what this process, what libraries are get loaded, what kind of things happening. In a kernel, it's totally different. So in, in particular target, you might have different set of processes running, doing different system goals, everything like interrupts happening, everything can kind of affect all of this picture and, and you really have much less visibility and control over it. So with that in mind, so what is so special about Linux kernel stock which kind of makes it attractable? I kind of named one of the three things which I think it's important. So first of all, it has a deterministic structure. So here I have an example of this kernel stock for x86-64. So it's actually four pages. Uh, 
of size, grows downwards because of how the stack is positioned in the memory, so the high address being and low address being at the bottom, so it kind of grows down. So it's having these, uh, it usually starts, so what, what you use this stack for, in case, like I think everyone knows it, but just in case, so for example, if you are a process, if you are a thread running in user space, you issue a syscall, and at that point you need to, uh, you're transitioning to a kernel space, and the kernel needs to start serving that syscalls on behalf, of, uh, for your behalf, and uh, you can't allow the kernel execute on a user space stack because it's unsafe, so you're gonna use this nice, small, and um, compact stack to kind of pr process your syscall, for example. And it's gonna be very deterministic how this whole thing is gonna be laid out. So you're gonna have a PTR extraction beginning, which is gonna have some of your syscall parameters stored and some very important things. And when you'll start as you're processing your syscall and calling a function, you'll start piling your stack frames similar like you do in user space. Some of the part it will be unused. It used to be also that you'll have this special thread info a structure located at the bottom. Now it's not like the case anymore if you're having that, that um, uh, config option on. So. But as you can see, it's very deterministic. Every time you're gonna enter a syscall, because this page is allocated once only for each thread, so any subsequent syscall you're gonna enter and start growing your stack from the same place down and, and kind of exit to need, and you're gonna have the same. Of course, stack frames might be different and based on what kind of syscall you're processing, but still, there's a lot of deterministic uh, and usage, and it, it's highly used because, well, this is always what you're gonna use for processing syscall. It's predictable because this is how way you're gonna be using it. And it's also, as many things have shown, usually stack leaks are very common, so it's quite easy for attackers to locate where this, um, this stack is actually situating in your memory, so that it helps you combating this thing that you don't quite have this visibility of a memory out. So these are kind of the three things which I believe, which has, depending on very different, like you can have very different attacks, but still these three, three things have been like a key of what at least I saw been a very kind of important thing for attackers. So now before going to explain you these attacks, I want to kind of make one distinction because it confused me in the past and, and sometimes it also confuses people because terminology is kind of a bit confusing. So there are two different types of attacks. So everyone usually knows what buffer overflow is. So this is like, I showed an example of a kernel stack, but the user space stack will look kind of, and they actually started to have this old attack timeline. So the attack started back in 1996 of user space. So what you will typically have, you'll have your stack frame, you'll have an argument you, uh, for this function, you have a return address, and then you start piling your local variables. And if you manage to have their local buffer, which is located, and, and developer didn't do due diligence, you can, it allows you to doesn't check the proper boundaries, you can overflow it, because since stack grows downwards, you're gonna overflow the other way around, and you overwrite the return address, and this is a classical buffer overflow. And there's a long history of attacks and protections against it, but it's not quite of attacks I'm gonna be talking now. So what I'm gonna be talking now mostly, it's what we call a stack overflow, and I stole the definition from our one researcher, Sion Oberheide, uh, he has been actually behind some of these attacks that I'm gonna show you. And um, so his definition was that the stack pointer, when the stack pointer gets decremented beyond the intended bounds of the memory which was allocated for stack, this is what he calls stack overflow. And I really like his definition, it's very kind of descriptive. So here you can see what your stack pointer, because when you execute on a stack, you always keep a tracking of where your stack pointer pointing to. And if you somehow, by doing some, something, you manage to get your stack pointer out, this is the stack overflow. So this is like very important to understand, not to get confusing. And, and now I'm gonna walk you fastly for some of the attacks, and I try to kind of, there's many more attacks, and I try to select kind of the attacks based on the class of attacks it represents, to show you one particular kind of uh, interesting pattern which attackers used, and it will help us to understand the mitigations which were implied, uh, which were developed uh, later. So, uh, and as I said, I don't have time to go into details, but I will try to highlight the most important things about each attack. So the first attack I'm gonna show you is from 2011. So, and it used the, uh, and I have the references at the end for all the slides behind each of these attacks. I encourage you if you're interested in details, and we can talk also after, but we can go ahead also and, and check the attacks. They're really interesting, even details are really like, many of them are really like pieces of art, so in, in a certain extent, so. So the first attack is this uh, initialized attack, so it's actually cases attack. So, um, so what it did, it used this uh, property, so not property, it used to feature that you might have an initialized variable located on a stack. 
So what it is, it's usually kind of some object and um, it's a structure union, union it was in this particular case, which developer in certain path, they forget to initialize some part of it. So explicitly initialized in the beginning. And if you manage to find an overlapping path, like subsequent C's call, in this case it actually was the same C's call, just with different parameters. So if you manage to overlap, uh, find an overlapping path, which kind of, so you, you, your kind of strategy here would be that you use first C's call to pre-fill some data, and that uh, kind of, is, which later one will be this, this part of the data used in a struct later on. So you pre-fill the data for token control value, and then you issue a subsequent C's call where you will use this initialized kind of pre-fill data for you to resolve it. And this is possible because, as I said, that the kernel stack is done in a way that each subsequent C's call starts from the same place. It goes down and kind of starts building with the frames, and when it exits, it exits, but nobody cleans the stack after you. It's, it has whatever it had from previous, so, so it's possible. And uh, what is commonly also used in these cases is this copy to or copy from user primitives. So there were the primitives which are used to copy data to and from between a user space and a kernel. And here it was a copy from user data, and this particular talk, but others are also um, published. So what you do here is that you will, if you're able to find this copy from user call with a destination pointer, which you can pre-fill using this, this, this previous kind of pre pre preceding C's call, so you're able to influence basically the destination from there, uh, kind of uh, to where the data is copied to. So what you're basically creating is, is arbitrary write primitive, what kind of exploit writers call it. So, which means that you're able to arbitrary overwrite kernel addresses at certain places. And it's very powerful, and in this case, and, and how you do you take it from where the attack, it's actually not so important for many ways, and it's like you mentioned, imagination is the only bound. In this particular case, it used that primitive to override a function pointer, a socket destruction function pointer, which was under attacker control, and when attacker closes the socket, this function pointer, overwritten function pointer, gets invoked, and it would just go ahead and execute this traditional, traditional payload to kind of raise your privileges. So, uh, so this is like how you can use a copy from user. If you use copy to user, the source, uh, source pointer, it's, it's gonna create your arbitrary read primitive because you're basically gonna tell that, okay, copy me this address, content of this address to the user space. Copy me content of that memory address of a kernel to user space. You can just get the data out of a kernel. So to summary, so this, the key things which were used here, of course, we, you had to find an initialized variable which one overlapping path, you have these primitives here helping you to do the job. But again, all this kind of is based on the fact that you can precisely overwrite a certain offsets and pre-fill the needed data, and then a subsequent C's call resolve it. If you're not precise, you're really crushing a kernel, and this is what you don't want to do. So this, this, this deterministic, again, structure is very important here. So the next, uh, the next talk is called start checking, same year. And it had, uh, it's kind of had this assumption, so it already assumed the talker to have an arbitrary write primitive to begin to, uh, to begin with. And the, how do you get it? I've just shown one way with initialized talk how you get an arbitrary write primitive. There are other ways, so it just made this assumption. But here, if, if we kind of heard in a previous attack case, use it to this arbitrary write primitive to override a function pointer, it's not always that you have this luxury. I mean, the function pointers, you might not find a suitable one. Function pointers tables might be protected. So this kind of try to be more generic and say, okay, what can we do if we have an arbitrary write primitive but we want to get high privileges? So what it tries to show you here how from arbitrary write, you're actually getting an arbitrary read primitive. And together, they're very powerful, because if you have both, you can read the data, you can find the data you need, like location of a credential structure, and then you can overwrite that to get a root privileges. So how do you get there? How do you get from write to read? Using the stack. And why? So again, first answer is that because stack is easy to find. It's, uh, it used what it called like self-discover location of a stack. It's used it for either like your own process or for a child process, depending on which techniques they used. And what it needs for it, it also kind of assumes that you manage to leak some address, some pointer, which would be pointing to some address in the stack. So for example, if you manage to leak the pointer to some local variable which is located in the stack, you can kind of using a simple arithmetic because stack is fixed sized and you kind of, it's aligned and everything. You can, you can basically calculate the, 
stock base address so you will know where your stock starts and ends and you already suddenly enough you have a right primitive plus you have this perfect stock structure or not stock structure stock stock pages that you know where they exactly are and you can try to kind of uh, proceed from there so it, it proceeded from there using different techniques and the first technique is kind of, uh, it's, it used to fact that we used to have this special structure at the bottom of the stack, which is called the trade info. It was located at a fixed bottom of the stack, easy to find, and, it, uh, and the goal of that kind of first approach is then try to kind of override, because you have an arbitrary right, try to override something in that structure which allows you to raise privilege. Uh, a classical approach was like at some point of time was to overwrite the address limit uh, variable located in a thread info because if you can put a kernel DIN DS value there, like if you can change that, you, you're basically allowing this copy to and from user to not verify arguments and copy your data between the kernel and kernel to kernel or like it kind of basically gives you this primitives right away and read primitive including. But it's not so, this first one is not actually that interesting because it kind of relies on this thread info being there and, and many things and it's actually, it, it does many other dances there to kind of get, get there. But um, I like the second one more because it's more generic. So there it doesn't assume any thread info at the bottom. What it tries to, again, uh, have is, is, is what it does actually essentially, it, it spawns the child process, so the attacker spawns the child process. The child process uses this stack self-discovery to find where it's stuck located so that we get these addresses. It passes this info to a parent, but parent is aware now where it is. And then what happens is that it will put the, uh, so it will put the child to sleep and, and one important thing I forgot to mention is that it did have to find this, this copy to user call which would use, uh, which would be kind of done uh, from on the, uh, in the context of a child, but it would, because it already has an arbitrary right primitive, it doesn't need to have any of these uninitialized variables pre-filling, it can just go ahead and overwrite this copy to user um, source pointer, and that would give you straight with this arbitrary right. So it will pass a child, it will kind of put it to sleep, overwrite a pointer, Re restores the child, resumes the child, and when the child will perform this copy to user call with the information, with a piece of memory, the information of the memory, the address that you want to know. And, and this way you can actually like walk this whole thing from trade info, you can know where the stock struct is, from stock struct you can know where the credit struct is, and so on, so you can find the right location and you already have an arbitrary right, so you're gonna overwrite it. So this, this, was, um, this was done. And again, for both of these techniques, use different approach and everything. Important part is that when you, you need to precisely overwrite at a certain point of time the location in the stock. And this is very sensitive. Again, if you get it wrong, if you overwrite something wrong, you're gonna crush your target and I can almost feeling myself as this exploit writer books. We don't want to crush your target, so this is, this is very important. So we want to create reliably, or exploit writers want to create reliable exploits, so they would never go for approach that works once. And, 50 only times. So the next, turn on time, okay. So the next attack is, um, so if previous two attacks we were talking about something which happens within the stack itself, now we are getting kind of more interesting scenarios, so we are getting into what we call inter-stack exploitation, so there was the subsequent year attack which was called stack is back. And now uh, we are finding, again, we're using this child process scenario, but what we will do here is that we will uh, spawn our, ch our children processes, to, and they will use the same trick to rediscover their stocks and pass the information to the parent, and we will do it until we find us in a situation when the parent and the child stock is aligned. And it used to be that we didn't have any guard pages in between, so you really to look something like this, so you have a parent stock location and child stock and location underneath. And at that moment, so when you find this kind of uh, a situation, so you're gonna put a child right to sleep, and uh, what will you, so, so what you kind of intuitively what you need to do, you want to really kind of try to overwrite return address of a child, but you can't do it unless you have a way to extend your stack frame. So you basically need to go as much down from your own stack frame to reach this past your, look, past the end of your stack and into the um, stack of your child process. And in user space, there has been actually old work showing how to do it in user space from 2005. And, 
And there are a number of things you have. You have a local calls which allow you to give similar things. But in kernel, a local is banned, for example, and the, if you allocate a big local stack variable, compiler is clever enough, it will actually put it for you off the kernel stack because it really doesn't want you to do that, which is great. But what you used to have in kernel is this variable length arrays. So the example I shown here, it's, it's, it's basically an array with the length which is not known to compiler to compilation time. Because it, here, like here in example, it might depend on some runtime variable length. And if you find, to find, if you find such an array defined on your, your path which you're trying to exploit, and the size you can control, which means you can put it as much as you want here, uh, not as much, you actually want it as exactly as big as to kind of go down and not as much, so you precisely want to stop at this return address thing, so. So with, uh, you can basically create this variable length array. You can get safely over the kind of things you don't want to override. You will override the return address of, the, uh, of your child in this case, and then you will resume the child, and a child basically returns to attacker control address, and I guess, again, you can take it from there into kind of different paths you want, so. And again, this one is different approach. It, of course, uses the fact that you're able to find this variable length array and, and uses the fact that you can uh, uh, kind of get this uh, close allocation. It's, it's, it actually wasn't that hard in that time at all. You don't have anything in between, so you can just safely kind of override. But again, you need to be able to do it safely and if you need to know exactly how long your variable length array needs to be to override a particular precise place, so this deterministic and predictability is extremely important. A more recent example, so this is from 2016. The guy behind this attack is Jan Horn, and I, I, I kind of personally really <laughs> like this one because it's, it's pretty, in my point of view, of prettiness. So it's, it's again, it's also interstack exploitation, so because we are not just doing it within the stack, but we are not having the child process here underneath. We are, what Jan did, he's, he's basically creating Instead of child processes, you're creating data pipes, and each data pipe will get allocated uh, a page of data for it, and, and it will kind of keeps creating these pipes until he gets into this kind of picture here, so until his process stack, because it used to be that they would be allocated from the same kind of body allocator, so you will get to this, to this scenario where they are co-located, and our, what you do at that point is that you will, uh, and, and of course here, he used to trick that he found an arbitrary recursion bug, which was an encrypt FS, and there's many details to that, but that arbitrary recursion bug allowed him to kind of basically build as many, kind of keep doing with stack frames, as after stack frames calls, and, and he able to kind of recurse past the end of his own stack into this data pipe that he controls, into this pipe that he, sorry, pipe that he controls, and and at that point, when he made a recursion fast far enough, he would pass the process, he would overwrite the return address by writing into a pipe in a particular point, and he resumes the process, and the process returns to address, and again, the whole thing continues. So, again, uh, different, like, you had to find the recursion bug, and he actually, like, in some of the conversations he had, he said that it was actually pretty difficult to kind of really precisely align all these things, how they kind of, uh, to make sure that the stack frames align and, and, and you get kind of to override the right place. But the deterministic structure is also very important here because you want this whole thing to be stable and you want to know where you need to override. So the last, I think, yes, last talk I'm gonna show, it's, it's, I just want to kind of show this for the sake of an example that probably maybe if you're already thinking when I started talking about this, this interstack exploitation because the pictures that I showed here, we didn't have any guard pages in between, so kind of is a guard page a solution to it all? Well, in 2017, we had the stack clash, which basically showed that not, not quite. So because attackers can use the, again, this variable length arrays to basically jump over the guard page if it's present. It, the limitation, of course, where you have to find this variable length array, and it has to be not fully kind of writable because if you start writing into that, you're gonna hit the guard page. This is what you don't want to do. But uh, that attack basically showed how to kind of use this variable length array to perform a jump over a guard page. And then after a jump, I mean, you're again, you're, you're in some other memory allocation, which can be a child stock, like we showed in previous example, can be some other, other memory allocation, and you have this basically, basically two scenarios like we've already seen here. You can either kind of start overwriting the return address of the child, 
or you can tr start overwriting the data on the stack which went past. And so, so you basically kind of, you're freeing your choices what to do after, but the most important is that you're able to kind of, you're able to escape a stack. So your, your stack pointer is now out of the, we discussed in the beginning with stack overflow, your stack pointer is out of the borders, and you're kind of, you're enjoying yourself there. So now, now let's talk about your countermeasures. So, of course, all these attacks, each of them kind of uh, did the countermeasures in Linux kernels. These ones are very early on, which are not so specific to attacks. I showed just to kind of tell that, well, it has been a long topic. There's been some randomization, which have been initial randomization put into kernel to make sure that it's harder for attackers to kind of figure out the places and to know what's loaded where. Is a stack protector for simple buffer overflows. You have a canaries there. You kind of have this non-executable bit that it's not so easy for attackers to place their payloads and just execute them. So you kind of try to prevent them. We have even debug VX, which is trying to warn you if you have any of these areas enabled. So to kind of try to see, no, don't do that. But these are all the early ones. The interesting ones come are much more recent. Actually, after Jan published this and showed this, his attack with the CryptoFest bug, I got the Vima based uh, stack. Uh, it was merged set of patches by Andy, and uh, he basically moved his stack allocation from body allocator to Vim alloc region. It's much bigger region. We could afford starting to have a guard pages, so we started to have guard pages in between. And, and we similar, the same patch, formally different feature, but it was kind of developed at the same time. Remove the thread info out of there, so you kind of start to have the stack looking something like this, which is much nicer point of view. Another one, obviously, we already talked like in two places about this variable lungs arrays and why is it bad. So uh, that also kind of there was a big effort in case, case because leading with effort within the kernel, hardening project of VLA removal for the whole kernel. And I think it was in 2018, he declared it kernel to be VLA free, which is a great thing because we just basically removed attacker jump primitive for any kinds of attack, including this talk. And more recent thing was the uh, merging of this talk leak. It's a GCC plugin. And this plugin is basically trying to, kind of its main goal is trying to fight this uninitialized stack scenario. So when, when you're executing on your C call and you're exiting, before the exit to the user space happens, what it does for you, it's gonna actually go ahead and clean your stack frames. It kind of basically points, it poisons it with values to make sure that nothing really is staying there from a previous sys call, which can be reused by attackers. So, and, and, and this is kind of important thing to have. Okay, so after we looked at all these attacks and, and very recent, especially recent protections, so what open question is, so what do we have left? Is it kind of what is the state now? So what I'm trying to claim is that despite the fact that we have these protections merged, like which targeted these particular things like VLAs and uninitialized talk, and, and, and this absence of guard pages. What remains is still this, this properties of a stack which haven't kind of, which been kind of core, still core things to all these attacks. So, and so this deterministic structure, predictability, easier to locate. And uh, also another kind of angle to it, that there is this, uh, for example, think some of the countermeasures which are already there, they might not be enabled on all the registers because they can be performance impacting. And they can be quite a lot performance impacting depending on the load. So uh, I'm giving here an example of a stack leak with one of the micro benchmark, which I have been actually asked to do by Inga and Andy. And on, under that benchmark, uh, the stack leak, for example, is about 80% overhead. And that's already merged, so that's, but uh, it just indicates that it might not be enabled everywhere. And it's a GCC plugin, so you have to enable the GCC plugin infrastructure and do all of that. And also, all these protections which I've talked about, they have, they have existed for a long while, not in upstream kernel, but they have kind of been merged to upstream kernel only after somebody has shown and working and explored. So it kind of shows that we have some kind of, um, not maybe an issue, but like, can we be really more proactive and, and see what we can do even if there isn't, I can't show you any kind of exploit. So if you have everything that I talked about is enabled and put on. I don't have a ready-made exploit which I can show you to say that okay, we can break it all. But can we be more proactive? So, and, and the feature kind of that I started working past was, um, it's, it's not my idea and it's not a new idea. It's actually a very old idea uh, which was developed originally by Pax team uh, in 2003. It was called Front Key Stack. It was part of chess security. Uh, people know which is non-mainline uh, set of security hardening patches. 
And, and, and the main idea was there that, okay, let's remove this deterministic unpredictability by adding a small random offset from beginning of the stack on each syscall. So every time I process each syscall, when it starts building its own kernel stack, it would be kind of always offset it on some kind of random value. So you will always, you won't exactly know where the stack, where PTREX starts, where stack frames are. So every time kind of you do it, it it's gonna be a bit different. And when we started thinking about it, we also kind of thought, well, there's there actually our option of putting this random offset. You can also do it kind of, you can either do it the Pax way on the beginning, or you can do it in after a PTREX structure, so you basically kind of try to randomize what happens with your normal stack frames. And we, we can kind of we considered these two options that have been suggested. So the option one has some benefit when you're doing certain attacks, which would kind of use the fact that the attacker is able to store some reliably stole some data in PTREX. So I've been given kind of this example of a talk by one of the exploit writers. And, um, but the problem with this first approach is that what I've also been kind of, um, what I also understood while talking to people is that if you have a P-trace enabled scenarios and if you do some kind of allowed to do some cache probing attacks, it's quite easy to figure out where P, P, T, Rex are, even if you have this small random offset, because we can't do big offset. I mean, stack is so limited, it's only four pages long, so we can't, and if you start to allocate more pages for the kernel stack, we might have um, even longer discussion with maintainers. So, so you will have to do some small offset and it might be very easy to figure it out. So the event as a result, we kind of went with option two, uh, which would uh, basically leave PTREX in a place and it will do this random offset after the, uh, after the PTREX and then from there on if you start uh, building your stack frames. So the feature config option, which and the feature was posted I think first in kernel hardening and then we had long discussion on it in LKML. So you can find this discussion um, anytime. So the feature was called this config randomized case stack offset. So it did it. It's the way and, and I think the implementation I have written a number of, written fully like a number of times based on discussions of my trainers. And 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 uh, it turned out to be like implementation is very different from Pax or chair security, only with initial inspiration and idea is the same. So it's, it's kind of, it's randomizes on Cisco entry. The PAX was doing it on exit. It has, I mean, for this example, this is adjustable, of course. It has about five bits of entropy for randomization. So it's actually very tiny. You can see the macro here. It's basically what it takes because it, it uses this alloca call, which is bound for kernel, but it was actually suggested by Andy himself. I think Andy Ingo who suggested it. So kind of for this case, we were okay using it. So, and it's, it, it, it made it really beautiful and small. But of course, the devil is in detail, so then we ran into this, we kind of, it, it went really nicely with discussion and kind of adjustment of everything, till we ran out of the problem, okay, where do we get randomness from? So we, we need very little of randomness here, so like, I mean, we talk about eight to five bits um, that we will be happy with for this feature, but the problem is that we in is called path, so we need a fast randomness, like really, really fast. And when I started looking into what we have in the kernel, and I tried to kind of summary most common options for you in this small table here. So the first kind of, and, and this is what Pax, for example, using was read timestamp time counter thing, which is, which is very fast speed-wise, but unfortunately uh, it, it's pretty weak. It's kind of, it's, uh, at least theoretically it's considered, not so theoretically maybe, considered to be prone to the timing attacks. So even if you use the smaller uh, bits, of the uh, value that it returns, so still you can, one can kind of theoretically say that this is not very, very secure. So, but it, it was the fastest clearly. And then I started looking what else do we have on the other kind of spectrum, side of a spectrum, for example, for x86, we have the ERD RAND instruction. It's a CPU instruction to get the randomness from the, curve or from the CPU. It's very good randomness quality. I mean, it's, it's properly cryptographically secure random generator. It's which is there, unfortunately it's very slow. So it, it, it was completely out by just, just parameters which we measured. When you have things like p-random, which is a pseudo-random in-kernel pseudo-random number generator, which is also very fast, not as fast as timestamp counter reading, but also very fast. But when, and I was first very happy with finding it, thinking, okay, we're gonna use that. But then it turned out that actually when you look inside what it is, it, it's basically a set of, um, 
It's a linear combination of a couple of LFSRs, and this whole design is like 20 years old, and it's actually trivial but breakable if you assume that the tracker could get output of this, could get access to this base offset, so it's, it's like it doesn't need to collect that many before it breaks it, so it's fully linear, and, and, and uh, it's, um, so it's, I determined it to be like even weaker when the lower bits of uh, timestamp counter and kind of ruled that out. Uh, from the uh, design. So the middle ground, which I call it, was this get random bytes interface, which is basically interface towards in kernel cryptographically secure random number generator, which provides very good randomness, even crypto level randomness, but um, it's, it's based on charge 20, and uh, the problem, well, I, I found the performance kind of um, to be middle ground and acceptable, but of course, like when you start talking with maintainers, you have to take it in. I think this number of this, so I had this uh, benchmark which I was given, I believe, by Andy, and then uh, I think Ingo's numbers, which he said he would, he said he would be sad if he sees anything more than two to three percent degradation, and as this table kind of nicely shows you that you are not able to reach that goal, and, and by the way, he told me to measure everything with page table isolation off, because he, for those of you know, it's nothing to do related with this feature, but it's, it's this isolation between kernel and user space page tables, which were done because of the speculative execution. And it kind of the main thing for it, it was it would slow down the Cisco performance. So when I, I was asked to uh, measure this feature, I was said that, okay, measure against our good old days, please, not, not this kind of slow down thing. So, so uh, this is the bottom line. And as you can see, that like if you measure even timestamp counter against it, it's 6%. So, and of course, nothing like uh, this get random by doesn't, doesn't kind of, it's, it's either 4% in first case or 14, and, and that seemed to be too much for maintainers to consider. But again, this is like micro benchmarking that doesn't show anything on, on, on real case scenarios. So if you, again, use real load example, uh, like for example, Carol compile time, you see that the percentage increase we're talking about is, is really tiny. So it's, it's really not gonna kind of affect your real workload, but if you, stuck to bench, micro benchmarking when you can kind of get stuck there. And this is where this patch actually, patch said stuck, stuck about it. It's, it's the micro benchmark performance. So, because I looked into different of these options and I was looking into, can we speed up, get random bytes, but I have pre performance profiled it, but it, it's, it's uses an RD run in certain cases, which slows it down, but when there is, of course, charger permutation itself, which can't be kind of touched, and, and so I didn't see any secure way to spit it up. There many insecure ways, but we don't want to go there. So in principle, what kind of my idea here was that you don't have, we are not in the case where we need the crypto level randomness. We are not, um, because the cryptographic secure number generators, we have a number of principles or number of features which we don't need, like for example, backtrace resistance, so that you're able to kind of produce your, if you're seeing certain random numbers which are produced by your generator, but you're not able to uh, kind of find out what are the previous ones. We don't care, because after this offset is reused, it's used only once in the system call, and it's not going to be affected in kind of in runtime anymore. So this kind of feature wouldn't make sense for us. Of course, the future resistance, so what you can't predict the future output is important. But so I looked at some point into can we, for example, if we have this p random, which is super old uh, in a kernel, can we actually substitute that, or can we start to use a bit more modern kind of up-to-date random number generator, like this, this PCG number generator, for example, which is not, it's not cryptographically secure, but it still, it, it, it does provide you more, it provides you better properties, not just random and statistical properties, but still like, it's not so easy, it's supposed to be not so easy to invert a state from it, but again, it's not cryptographically secure, so I'm not proposing to using it for crypto, but it might have been possible to use it for this case, but I, I have made this proposal on the mailing list, and I don't think anyone kind of been interested to, in this whole idea much, so I kind of didn't, didn't, didn't go that way. So, okay, so to summary, so, Suppose we even get this merge, which at this point I don't think we will get, but uh, is, it, is it like, so we add this tucker randomization, so, but one thing, is it like, are they good now? Is it, is, are they done? So uh, I think the kind of important thing to remember about randomization, that it's always just a kind of a way to raise the bar for tuckers. So, and, and it can't be like any randomization, can it be a panacea? You usually kind of need to tie it, couple it with additional, measurement, uh, additional measures to make it robust. And, and for example, things which would be really nice to have in the kernel is things like this control flow integrity. So, but I think we are still not so close to getting it anywhere. 
to be usable in upstream kernels, so, but it might be pretty nice. So here are the references which I promised. So these are basically the references for all attacks I talked about, and, and they're really great to kind of read the details, and, and I really encourage you to go kind of study the. It, it was a fun process for me, and I learned a lot of things from this. And I'm grateful to every single explored writer from this list who teached me enormous things. So I don't know if you have time for Q&A or I'm fully out. Okay, so questions? So this may be because I have a hardware background, but this feels like something where hardware and the CPU could help. And, and I, don't, I can't go any more than just this feeling. So are, are people looking at that at all? So, so this RD RAND instruction, which I mentioned, that's the CPU instruction to obtain you for randomness. The problem, as I said, it was very slow. So uh, uh, it's also possible that there are more have been pointed, for example, some of the perf uh, kind of the instructions, which not security instructions, but relate to obtaining some randomness from some physical kind of hardware things. What I didn't want, I want this to be generic enough. So I didn't want to tie this to any, because this is, we're talking about upstream kernel, we're not talking about particular projects. So it had to kind of work on any hardware. So you'd have to anyway have some backup, which is reasonable backup to kind of be, to, to work it if you don't have this instruction or you're in a different architecture or something. Even though, of course, this, this code would be executed in, in x86 case, so in principle, I could tie it myself to x86 and say, but okay, we use ARD round or something else. But ideally, I was really hoping to get something which is generic enough. And, and, and because you will need to make this, this generic backup, but um, these generic options seem to be very, very difficult. This is a question regarding the, uh, the hardware support as well. Like, so you see, it, I guess if there was a register that could maintain the limits of the stack, such sort of checking could be done cheaply in, uh, from the hardware itself. So wouldn't that be another, uh, uh, like a boundary? If this is a stack pointer, and this is how much it is supposed to, how much it can go for this particular context. So. Oh, you, you're talking about the stack overflow. I think it's, it's partly done, so if you're trying to kind of now with this, Part of this V malloc stock allocation and guard pages. So there is this detection, which suppose so if you get to this double fault and, and you're verifying that it's it's close to the end of stock, so it's your understanding what your overflow is stock and stuff. So there is this software, not hardware specific, but software specific logic with ND putware, which tries to kind of verify you the stuff, but I mean, that logic is only basically bump, kind of, it gets invoked when you double fault. And in order to double fault, you kind of get to have to arrive to double fault, and, and if you're kind of managing to trick this thing to kind of pass this, like our jumping or something, then it's what is the hardware logic you're going to use. So, right. thanks for the good talk, Elena. So, I have a, <coughs> actually one question about I would like to ask your opinion while talking about hardware, uh, like for example, Intel CET, which is using the shadow stacks, and which should be quite efficient, and also this ARM has this pointer authentication and so on. How do you see using these technologies, for example, for protecting uh, kernel stack? It's, again, it can be usable technology. Again, the problem with that is that it's gonna be hardware specific. So you're gonna have one Intel kind of technology for this thing, be, I don't know, ARM for something else, or AMD for things. I was trying to kind of, again, we're talking about upstream kernel, not particular projects, so you try to think, make something generic, so. In wet light is kind of, they said too specific. So they probably if you have some concrete product you're doing on and, and you're able, you're not limited by this upstream thing, you can kind of be, you can even go, I mean, patches are there, you can enable it with, and if you're able to take certain, I don't know what performance hits, for example, would be from using of that. Even RD Rand, which is a CPU instruction, which was completely like, I was like, when I looked at the performance numbers, I was thinking, well, it's a CPU instruction, it should be fast, and when I was looking at the numbers, it was horrid. So I'm, I'm, I'm afraid with that, my, I don't know what's the overhead for all of that technologies, but it's, yeah. So, but if you're not performance sensitive, I think you have a lot of options here and, and you can make it relatively easy, so. so uh, I saw a tweet this morning that um, LLVM support for control flow guard has been submitted for review. Do you know? Okay, that's um, great. So LLVM can build the kernel. But for the compiler, LLVM hmm. can build the, the Linux kernel, can it? Okay. Okay. 
JCC unfortunately doesn't have that yet. <laughs> we'll wait. Yeah, there's not JCC. Maybe we should switch to something else, but it's not. So was it the VLAs had to be removed to get LLVM support? Was that related? Okay. Okay, I think we're out of time in this session. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. Everyone.